Hello everybody, it's Merlin here, and welcome to another wonderful Merlin cast. Uh, I'm doing this solo today, and uh, just to let you guys know, I'm thinking about possibly kind of mixing up the format again for Merlin cast. Hopefully they'll be early in the week coming out. I'm thinking either Monday or Tuesday they should be released. And lately I've been doing them with a lot of my friends, but I've been thinking about doing some more focused podcasts. So I'm thinking about maybe if I have one of my friends who can join me to talk about a particular topic, that can be a segment for the show. Like we can have the couple news items and stuff we'll talk about like we usually do, and then maybe we'll have just kind of the last part of the podcast to just be a discussion about one topic, because some of my friends might know more about some things than others, and you know it's always kind of the thing where one or two people might want to come, but there'll be a, a section of the podcast where they feel like they can't contribute as much. So uh, I'm thinking about maybe keeping it more concentrated, and maybe for bigger events we'll try to get more people out there, but you know, see if we're joining together. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, I'm actually, sometimes I guess I'll just do them myself. I'm also going to see if I can get some other YouTubers back on here as guests. Uh, I'm kind of reaching out to some other people, possibly uh, Diamanda Hagen. You guys might know her. She uh, kind of reviews like a bunch of really weird uh, kind of exploitation films and low-budget horror movies and things like that. So hopefully she'll be a guest and a bunch of YouTubers you guys know, of course. Like maybe we'll get some other people from the Phantom Group on here in addition to some of my friends from the Merlin cast that are regulars. But anyway, uh, that's kind of in the works. I decided I was going to just do a couple things a little bit differently today. Uh, I had a couple articles I was looking at that I thought might be worth talking about, and there were a couple uh, videos first I wanted to react to. Uh, I recently wrote a little article kind of discussing some of the uh, games that are going to be released at E3. Uh, Now, I'm not a huge gamer, as you guys know, but I actually saw a couple games that really interested me. And uh, one of the games was uh, actually apparently Call of Cthulhu. There haven't been many Lovecraftian games official, like, based around the lore that have been released, and there have only been, like, one or two good ones. I think uh, Dark Corners of the Earth, I played a little bit of that. That was pretty good. A hard game. But that's, like, the only major one I know of that's, like, officially based on Lovecraft stuff that was decent. Uh, So this one... I think it's supposed to be like kind of a mystery open world uh, based around A Call of Cthulhu and also some of the other stories. So I was going to watch the video and I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a a reaction here to this one and we'll talk about it briefly. So I'll start that now. Okay, open it up to this dreary New England town. A lot of fog looks like. Uh, this This is creepy. There's like... Talking about people being crazy, graveyards, whatnot. No, uh, I don't know. I mean, so far I'm looking at this atmosphere and it looks pretty cool. It kind of reminds me of Dark Corners of the Earth, where you go into this mansion and there's just like, there's, there's just kind of abandoned and it's really creepy. And I guess it's, sure, oh, there's like a creepy doll that's worn out. It's like a first-person survival sort of vibe I'm getting from this. Oh. Somebody's chasing you. Hmm. This is... Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> You're breathing rapidly. Okay, so far this is mostly just a cutscene inside a house, so it's like, it's creepy, but... Like, I don't see anything too Lovecraftian yet, but it's still pretty early in the trailer. Okay, now we're in a mine. They're doing weird experiments, cutting things up. Weird, like, artifacts and stuff. Uh Uh-oh, someone's noticing. Ah! Guys, it's scarred up faces coming after you. Weird, like, cross demon men. Oh, this could potentially be very interesting. Uh, and you're kind of floating in some sort of weird, like, underwater, or is it like in a space or another dimension or something? It's a really creepy vibe. Okay, now you're up in, like, a, a hospital. Well, 
This is creepy. Well, it's interesting. I, I feel like it could be... Alright, based upon what I just saw there, I feel like... It looks to me like... I, I'm wondering if the a lot of the survival stuff is going to be like you're in a, a dream state or it feels like a flashback because most Lovecraft stories, it's kind of like the guy wakes up or he interviews you and he, he's talking to you and kind of recounting his tale of what happened before. That's like how most Lovecraft stories go. And they talk about what happens. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of times these people are believed as crazy and they still think the things are after them, which they may be, may not be, and you can't really tell. So a game that's kind of kind of blur reality with what might actually be happening and it might kind of switch back and forth perhaps between like the inner cuts with you trying to exist in the, the everyday life, but there might be some weird things going on like a, around the, the corner of your eye, kind of always around you, and then maybe go back to it, you know, and, and you find yourself in this horrible situation which you remember, and, and you got to unlock a conspiracy. I don't know, but uh, it looks pretty cool. looked like it's very atmospheric, which is something I really like, and I think that, you know, Lovecraft needs is slowly getting much more popular. He's kind of always been a pretty substantial force. Like, he's one of those guys that I feel like he, a lot of people might not have known him originally, but, I mean, he's been influencing stuff for decades. It's kind of one of those things after his death, you know, it's like Though the world's really interesting and fascinating, so you know that's that's definitely one thing for sure. But let's see, we've got another thing I want to talk about. Apparently, there was this movie called The Foreigner, which has Jackie Chan and Pierce Brosnan in it, and uh, I haven't heard about it, so I'm going to watch that now, and uh, I'm going to tell you what I think about that. See if it's any good. Got to wait for this ad here. It's about the Dark Tower, which I'm moderately excited about. Got Jackie Chan looking. He's getting older. He's shooting people up with... Okay. Let's see what we got here. Jackie Chan's a family man. Of course. Oh, God. And the, the daughter explodes. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Casino Royale's director. That's cool. Oh, uh, Oh, uh, Jackie Chan in a revenge movie. Pierce Brosnan's a desk man. And he's named after a beer, Mr. Hennessy. <laughs> a lot of explosions. You know what this is? <laughs> I know what this is now. Like I, I, I realize now. Like it, I, I'm watching about a minute of this trailer, and it just kind of made me realize what it is just now. I mean, it's a revenge movie, but this is Jackie Chan doing the whole Liam Neeson Taken thing. You know, the whole kind of sixty-year-old badass former secret agent guy goes on revenge. Like, I mean, that's what it is. Um, I mean, t to be honest, uh, okay, well, I think, I'll be honest, I'm interested, I think one of the cool things about Jackie Chan is that he's, he's been more known, I think, for doing more comedic roles, generally speaking, even though it's action, he usually does a lot of more funny-oriented stuff. This actually looks like it's a more serious action movie, but, you know, Jackie Chan also has done a lot of serious roles, too. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty cool. It looks like Jackie Chan. He's he's getting up there, but he's still doing those stunts, still being awesome. Uh, you know that. But and that's that'll probably be cool to see just for that. You know, it's just kind of a gritty Jackie Chan movie, a little more serious. But you know, then again, it's also the same formula that we've been seeing a lot since Taken came out. You know, so <laughs> the the what is it? The pre geriatric action stars. I mean, you know, it's it's something everyone's been trying to do. Uh, Liam Neeson's kind of been stuck in it since then. It kind of restarted his career, and a lot of other actors like Kevin Costner have done it with mixed success. But Jackie Chan actually is really steeped deeply in action roles and still does a lot. So that could be entertaining, I think. But uh, those are just some brief movie reactions. I was also going to move on to some topics I saw. Uh, one was about Blade possibly getting another movie, and if that happens. Now, I think Blade, as far as superhero movies go, it's kind of like one of those unsung heroes. It, it really was 
influential because in the late 90s, I mean, that's kind of when superheroes were kind of starting to rebound again because they had kind of had that, that peak in the in the 80s with the Superman movies and then into the early 90s with the Batman movies, you know, but that was basically it. And then, unfortunately, the Batman movies, which were really the only real superhero movies you had access to, got really bad. And then there were some other ones like Spawn and steel and you know just, just some movies that generally for for different reasons weren't that great you know there was a lot of like things that were either mediocre or just some degree of not good and blade kind of dug superhero movies back from that grave they were slowly digging themselves into and it's really because of blade that we actually have superhero movies being as popular and, and starting off the boom you know, in the early 2000s and into now with superhero movies being basically the movies to see and everybody's modeling the Marvel franchise but all that started back with Blade who was you know not a super popular character that there wasn't I guess a lot of risk involved in investing in him getting his own movie and they picked Wesley Snipes uh, they made it pretty gritty it was basically an action movie you know vampires of course were coming back uh, and you know, I watched Bleed. I, oh, excuse me. I watched Blade uh, not too long ago, and I have to say, it holds up pretty well. It's a pretty decent movie. It's uh, entertaining. There are some elements of cheesiness, but it, it flows pretty well. It's enjoyable. And uh, I think the thing was, it kind of left at this weird time when superhero movies were starting to get big, but they weren't really. They weren't really getting into their stride yet. They hadn't really discovered exactly what they were going to do. There was still a lot of that uh, mediocrity, still a lot of really over the top, edgy, you know, like that. That I just I th I think of everything like Daredevil, 2002, uh, like the 2003 Daredevil and Elektra and and some of those movies. Like they're just trying too hard to be cool, and it's like they want to take themselves seriously, but they're still kind of campy. And Blade Trinity was kind of smack dab in the middle of that and that's where the franchise ended and then Wesley Snipes obviously had his tax problems and went away for a while went to prison so it kind of I guess put the whole Blade franchise on standby and because I guess for a long time I mean Blade was Wesley Snipes it was that universe and I don't think anybody wanted to touch it for a while plus I guess maybe the interest in Blade had gone down a bit for a while and there were a lot of other superhero movies now saturating the market but Wesley Snipes is back now now, I guess you could make the argument, you know, he's supposed to be kind of a, a vampire, ages really slowly, so, you know, now that Wesley Snipes probably looks like he's aged, he, he looks, he looks, you know, pretty good. I, I don't think he looks like he's aged dramatically, but, you know, he doesn't look like he did, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, so, would they want to bring him back? I, I, I almost want to say yeah, but, but maybe it's, it's kind of past this time. I think Blade should probably get a reboot of some kind. If Marvel Studios could do Blade, like a dark, edgy Blade, or even better, I think he would probably do really well in the Netflix series with you know Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and everybody. I think he would fit well with that because it's much more grounded. But then again, there are a lot of fantasy elements too, so I think it might be a good best of both worlds. So I'd like to see Blade come back. I think he's got a lot of potential. You know, cool superhero, good movie, uh, really influential. I think we should we could definitely see some Blade again in some form. I think in the near future. Uh, moving on. Uh, let's see to some other stuff. There was uh, this. <laughs> there, there is a, a, some kind of Star Trek related news. I know that I wanted to talk a little bit about Fox. Uh, Seth MacFarlane is going to be releasing the show on Fox called The Orville, which is basically a Galaxy Quest esque parody of Star Trek. And I know Seth MacFarlane is a a big fan of Star Trek, so I actually think it's possible he could do it justice, but then I'm thinking, it's Seth MacFarlane, it's going to be really crude, it's going to be kind of potentially low-brow, uh, I think, in a lot of ways, which I know that if it's something related to Star Trek, I think it's it's related to kind of a higher sense of thinking, generally, and at least, at least tries to be smart. I'm not saying that Seth MacFarlane can't be smart in his writing, we've seen evidence of that, certainly, but... I feel I have to say I saw the uh, the tree the teaser for it a little while ago, and I actually thought that it actually looked entertaining. Like one of the things I say, I don't really like Family Guy and American Dad that much anymore. Like I had its time, but I do like Seth MacFarlane as an actor. Like I like the characters he plays. I like his style of comedy. Like I guess sort of stand up or live action. I, I feel like he does have 
his own fresh perspective. And I think, like, I don't know if this will really work into the Orville necessarily, but I've always thought about Seth MacFarlane. I remember when uh, A Million Ways to Die in the West came out. I didn't really like that movie that much, personally. But I thought the more serious aspects of it worked pretty well. And I really think that Seth MacFarlane should consider trying to do more dramatic roles or take on more dramatic projects, because I actually think he sells them pretty well. I think he's decent at it. So I think that might be different. And I think the Orville... I think it's on Fox, so it depends, I think, in line with Star Trek Discovery, which I'm going to talk about, too, here. I think that might help its success, because that's the thing about Fox. It's like, it feels like they can't keep any shows. But if it's Seth MacFarlane and it picks up, it might be good. And if it actually has some decent parody, which with has some love for Star Trek, which, because of Seth MacFarlane, I'm pretty sure it will, then it might be good. I actually think I might check it out, maybe an episode or two, to see if it's funny. And, you know, if it's not, I, I won't watch it. But I, I do think that one might be worth checking out if you're a Star Trek fan. And if you like Seth MacFarlane, you'll probably check it out anyway. But relating to Star Trek, actually, uh, it turns out it looks like Jonathan Frakes has been added on to be one of the directors for Star Trek Discovery. And I think that's awesome because, uh, you know, Jonathan Frakes is actually a pretty good director. He is well-versed in a lot of Star Trek. He directed some episodes of Next Generation. And he also directed the best Next Generation movie, First Contact. So I think for him to get deeply involved with that, you know, I think could potentially be really good. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I'm not saying everything he's done has been golden, obviously, but I'm, I'm actually glad that they are getting some Star Trek alumni, some people that are deeply ingrained in the characters in the world and have a lot of experience with how it works to kind of at least bring some elements of the classic Star Trek the older series into this new one. So it doesn't feel too disjointed because I've heard that it's basically closer to the Abrams verse. And while I understand that to some extent, I still want this to be a more cerebral, dramatic, maybe slightly slower paced Star Trek. I'm not saying you can't have action. I'm not saying you can't have adventure and explosions, but sometimes we need to chill out and explore other issues because that is, in addition to being a, a sci fi adventure, you know, that, that character exploration and those philosophical and political issues and everyday issues are things that Star Trek is based upon. That's the bread and butter of Star Trek, really, you know. And so I, I hope that it, it'll bring some of that in, and I'm pretty sure that Jonathan Frakes will add some of that there. So I, I'm glad to see that he was added onto the roster. Also, a, a little bit of brief sci-fi news as well. Uh, it looks like Isaac Asimov's classic Foundation trilogy is going to be made into a TV show. Now, Isaac Asimov is, like, one of my favorite authors. I mean, he is basically, if you guys don't know, he is the pinnacle of science fiction. Like, the way we think of modern science fiction, especially the classic stuff, you know, the, the big, like, astronauts with the giant ray guns, <laughs> with the, the classic spaceships, you know, going out, like, exploring and fighting weird monsters and aliens and stuff, the, and the really, also, but also the really weird, like, cerebral uh, concepts and, like, really based in, in hard science and philosophy. Uh, you know, that's Isaac Asimov. Like, he is basically the father of modern science fiction. I mean, you could trace it back technically to Jules Verne or H.G. Wells or, you know, Mary Shelley, technically. But in terms of, like, how we think of modern science fiction, you know, stories and, and novels and influence on countless works afterwards, it's Asimov. And he's probably most famous for doing the, the robot trilogy, like iRobot, you know, and, and all that stuff, the, the laws of robotics. But his other one is Foundation, which uh, I actually tried to read a little while ago. It was a gift from my dad a couple of years back. I actually got through it quite a bit. I, I read it on lunch breaks and stuff. And I remember I really liked Asimov's works when I was younger, oddly enough. Uh, but I will say... Uh, a lot of his work is very, very dense, and I'm, I'm not going to say it's the most accessible. Like, you kind of have to get captured by the concepts and the world he creates, and he also writes some interesting characters, too. But his stuff is really deeply etched in physics and, and real mathematical equations, and, and his characters will be talking about trying to do things in their lab and figure things out that you're like, it's based in hard science because he actually was a scientist. So sometimes you feel like you're reading actual science, you know, which a lot of times you are, rather than a sci-fi story. But that's not to say that he didn't have interesting stories about murder and wars. There often is something like that going on. But he did explore a lot of cool concepts, and the foundation is 
basically this theory that society is going to all the all the planets all in the in the galactic federation are going to eventually be destroyed and there's these group of scholars that have been working to mathematically figure out how society is going to shift and cycle and figure out a way to try and save that and so it kind of follows these stories over countless generations as these different people kind of work together over time to save everybody and it's really interesting uh, i think my only real problem with it in all honesty is that it's broken up into parts like a lot of his novels are where it's stretched out over a, a lot of periods of time so you'll spend one time working with this one scientist or this one engineer guy and you know you'll spend a, a about a chapter or so on him you'll figure out what he's doing you'll get involved with his character you'll get attached to him and then you'll shift to another character and that was the one thing that i mean there it felt like a lot of little short stories which is honestly why i think asimov short stories are great because it seems like he he has a really good job of getting you to really immersed in that character and what they're doing within a short period of time but if he does a novel I've never read a novel by Isaac Asimov that followed like one group of people or one person throughout the entire thing. He likes to jump around to like go to this place, this time with these people. So for it to be a TV show, I'd be interested to see how they're going to work around a lot of that, try to make it more accessible. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be like I, Rob, I, Robot with Will Smith where it kind of lost almost all identity with the source material. But I think it could be really interesting. I think it would work better as a mini series, kind of following the different aspects of these different people. It could be cool. It could be really cool to see. I'm glad Asimov's getting more adaptations. But yeah, I just thought that was worth mentioning. So if you guys are interested in that, check out some of his works and you know maybe check out the show. Hopefully it'll be good. Uh, wanted to kind of end on some anime stuff and uh, maybe maybe a few other things if we have the time. But I saw. I saw this one little article I thought was pretty funny. Apparently, Vegeta in Japan, the character Vegeta from Dragon Ball, has been being used uh, to market to market different kinds of uh, health campaigns. And it looks like there's a refrigerator brand uh, that's using him. And he's he's uh, let's see, he's actually there are actually like different types of recipes that are heavily based around vegetables. Yeah, you know, that are that are health based that they're selling using Vegeta's brand, and they've got like, there's this uh, this <laughs> accompanying Vegeta uh, Dragon Ball Super cutting board that goes with it, and uh, I think it's really cool. And they've also got some like tote bags, and it's it's cool that they're using uh, Vegeta. You know, this the, the guy that in the Funimation dub is known for that line about being <laughs> training to be a Super Saiyan by. <laughs> doing a lot of push-ups and setups and drinking plenty of juice they're using that concept you know and the the whole concept behind dragon ball of bettering yourself through physically working for it and training yourself through physical regimen which i think is an attractive prospect for dragon ball for a lot of people and uh, regarding a lot of other shonen series as well but they're using that concept to kind of push people in general but especially younger people kids to eat healthy when they're doing it so Kind, kind of cute, you know, kind of, kind of simple. But I thought that was pretty cool. I always like it when companies and franchises kind of use their influence for good, and I think that's cool. Like, you know, be like Vegeta. You know, he, how did he get to be really strong and be a Super Saiyan? Well, he worked out a lot, but he also ate right, a lot of fruits and vegetables, and like, you know, that's, that's awesome. I thought, I thought I'd kind of spread that. I thought that was cool to see that. But another piece of anime news. I mean, this is kind of old news, but apparently the new poster for the Death Note live action show. You know, we actually do see Willem Dafoe as Ryuk. And let me see if I can actually bring up the image now. I mean, I, I, I heard that and I automatically was on board with it. I'm like, you know, okay, maybe we'll see how he looks. But, okay, let's check out Ryuk. Yep, there's like a little bit of a shadow of him there. Uh, I think, I honestly think, uh, you know, he, he looks pretty cool. He's got one of those faces that he looks demonic. You know, I remember there was kind of a joke, I think, by Weird Al, you know, that he, in one of the old uh, songs about the Spider-Man movie, he, he looks scarier without his mask on as the Green Goblin, which, you know, that costume is terrible. So, you know, he, he has one of those faces, he looks really crazy, and he looks really mean, you know, so th that's, that's, I'm actually cool with that. I, I know that some people might be a little eh, resistant to the idea of another anime live-action adaptation, but Death Note's one of the ones that is the most accessible over here in the West, so I think that converting it to a Western audience really isn't that bad. There's a handful of them, I think, that they're actually kind of okay to do, and 
Death Note's literally one of the most popular accessible anime series over here, so I'd say give it a shot. But I think that casting Willem Dafoe as Ryuk, you know, that that seemed I was perfectly on board when I heard that. And uh, speaking of the Green Goblin transition, uh, apparently Marvel's thinking they should avoid uh, using the Green Goblin in the Spider-Man Homecoming. And uh, honestly, I have to agree with that, you know, because if they are planning to have the this new Spider-Man be part of an ever-expanding universe, and he's actually going to be around for a couple movies, hopefully without rebooting again immediately, you know, it's kind of annoying, you know, they would build up to the Green Goblin, because we've seen the Green Goblin twice, two different iterations, actually technically three times if you want to count Harry Osborn's version and the Sam Raimi movies, we've gotten a lot of exposure to the Green Goblin lately, and Green Goblin is like Spider-Man's arch nemesis, one of them, and you know you got to build up to that. You got to make it more intense, and you got to make it more worthwhile. And I think that it's just something that's easily, honestly, overdone. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to Spider-Man: Homecoming. You know, with with the Vulture, I think it could potentially be really cool. But yeah, you know that I agree. Probably should avoid the Green Goblin. Maybe we get the Hobgoblin in there. That would be cool. That'd be a little different. But, uh, yeah, I just want to give you guys, um, I guess, just a, a little bit of a discussion here real quick as an update to the channel. Anybody listening out there, uh, as you guys might know, uh, I'm kind of going through a bit of a transition trying to kind of reboot my channel a little bit, get more organized. And lately I've been feeling more enthusiastic about doing things, so that's been cool. I'm going to try and keep consistently getting out these podcasts to you weekly, you know, having some guests, maybe having some people on, trying to get them out here like every Monday, Tuesday. So keep expecting that. Uh, I've also kind of compiled a list. I've done this a couple times over the years, but there's a bunch of topics I do want to talk about. I'd like to, I would actually like to do some full reviews for you guys, and I'm planning on doing uh, a couple Patreon requests because there's I got a bit behind the last couple months, so I'm going to be talking about a few anime series and a couple movies. And I'm, then I'm going to try and dive into some maybe full reviews. I'm not sure if they'll be available on the, my YouTube channel or on my website or both, but I kind of want to try and give you guys some in-depth analysis and thoughts on just a bunch of my favorite movies, basically. And I've got you know a b- bunch of my favorite movies left in here in no particular order. So I've got a, I've got a list. So if you feel like any particular movies you might want to hear about that you know I like or shows, definitely do. And uh, I'm also going to try and talk about some other stuff too, some more more novels maybe, some more comic books, maybe even some video game stuff. But I'm going to try and dive into those in the next month or two, and I want to at least get potentially one full review of a movie uh, or a franchise or like a, a full Merlin review at least once a month. But I have to get a couple old requests out of the way. And you know, if you guys feel like you know donating to the channel, you know, in any way you can do that and put in a request, and maybe I'll get that through. But please feel free to check out my Patreon, check out my site for other things. And uh, otherwise, you can check out the Phantom Group. Uh, I got some buddies over there that are collaborating. I've been doing some stuff with Phoenix Guy, uh, formerly Phoenix Guy, he's Vaughn the Stampede now. And I did a podcast with him talking about getting to my Dragon Ball experiences. You can check that out on his channel. And the Anime Hero has been doing a lot of updating on various things, too. So he's going to be working on some stuff. And, of course, you can check out Zoro for One Piece and a bunch of other things. I know George is doing a bunch of reactions to things, too. So everybody's busy. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing some more podcasts soon. Uh, my buddy Dan, I think, is still doing movie and show reviews. I occasionally show up over there. So check out Dan Reviews It There. That's Film Fanatics podcast formerly. And, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have for you guys. Kind of a brief podcast today. But in the comments below, any topics in general you want me to talk about in future podcasts, anybody you want me to see get on here, uh, any films or shows or comics you'd like me to discuss or review at some point in the future, you know, please feel free to let me know. But I'm going to wrap it up, guys. That was today's Merlin cast, and I'm going to say goodbye. Stay magical.